So um, it was about 20 years ago, and um, I was uh, I, I always went to this one Chinese restaurant that also had a cooking school. It was actually called Ku's School of Oriental Cookery. <laughs> and I went up to uh, the counter and I ordered some things. And I had talked to this woman a lot, you know, and, and she knew I was a minister. And she said, you know, I have a question. I hope you're not too offended. But, uh, you know, I came to this country about 10 years ago. I'm Buddhist. Um, and I kind of understand Easter because it was Easter week. She says, but there's something I just can't get. And I don't know who to ask, so I'm going to ask you. I said, okay. She says, what is the Christian significance in the Easter story of the bunny rabbit and the eggs. <laughs> and I knew the answer to that. I said it was the fertility goddess Eastray. I'm not making this up. Of the Saxons. It was a Saxon fertility goddess that they named Easter after. Don't tell the people in the fundamentalist churches. But that is the truth. And the Saxons, especially in England, uh, in their fertility festival in the spring, spring is life and the renewal, and they wanted to have babies, so what better symbols than rabbits and eggs? And that's why we celebrate that. You say, wow, I'm not so sure about that. And uh, she was tickled by it. But you know, around that same time, um, in fact, I think it was that year, Rosalie was about, so it wasn't quite 20 years ago, she was two and a half years old, and um, uh, Lynn, uh, it was on a Saturday, had explained to her all about the Easter Bunny, because she was old enough that she was going to have this Easter Bunny experience, and so Lynn explained it all to her, and um, about three, four hours later on Saturday, Rosalie said, hey, when that rabbit coming? <laughs> and Rosie said, what? She said, why are coming to my house? And Lynn said, well, what are you talking about? You mean the Easter Bunny? Yeah, that a wabbit. <laughs> when that wabbit coming to your house? Okay, so there's a point to this, and that is life, life, life eternal, life always victorious, life that is greater, and life that is meaning taking a spiritual step, not staying complacent, life that is coming out of the darkened tomb, life that's coming out of the experience of Good Friday, life that is a fertility, certainly, but life that is, is coming forth in you. And when that wabbit coming, you know, what, what is it in your, but you have to invite it in. I invite the wabbit in, together, I invite the wabbit in. Now this is okay, there's some religious significance to this, I'm going to get to it, I might as well just read it now. This is what happened. You know, the thing about Easter is that whatever they thought it was, it wasn't that. And, and, and the disciples, the biggest thing about it was the shocking surprise of Easter. It was the shocking truth of Easter was that everything they thought wasn't true. They thought that this terrible disaster had happened. The whole world had fallen apart. And in your life, you feel like a catastrophe may have happened. The whole world came apart. But the truth is that it's just pushing you into greater expression. The, the egg's got to crack for the good stuff to come out. I don't know how to fit the rabbit into it, but you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and she wept, and she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she said, They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they put him. Okay, now that's that feeling of, I don't know what's going on. I've lost something. It's not working. At this, she turned around, she saw Jesus standing there, but she could not recognize that it was him. Why? Because of the tears, because she was stuck in Good Friday, thinking he was a gardener. She listened to him when he said, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? She said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, I'll go get him. And he said, Mary, and she said, Teacher. She recognized him then. He called her. So she had to invite that experience in. Okay. What was this Good, good Friday that she was stuck in? She was stuck in this experience. You know, I'm, I shared on Good Friday the story of the woman who came to me in my first church, very upset because I was altogether too positive on Holy Week. Did not give enough significance to the suffering on the cross. And I said to her, you know, you, did you have any children? She said, yes, I had one son. I said... If I may ask, how long were you in labor? And she said, two hours. I said, do you associate his life with that pain? 
You went through it. You honor it. But you went through it. She says, but I still don't feel like you do enough to talk because this was an important part of his life. I said, okay, how long was Jesus on the cross? Three hours. And how long did he live? 30, 33 years. And how long has it been since? 2,000 years. You do the math. <laughs> it's an important, significant part, but you've got to move through it. So if there's something in your life that's brought you to this place, you've got to honor it because it has a significance, importance, in so far as it brought you to this place. But now, if you feel like I've, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've put him, eh, something, something's got to open up in you. You've got to open up to a new experience. You've got to open up to something new. But it means you've got to let go of the the stuck place in your consciousness that can't move, that place that has given up, that place that, that, is, that is stuck in the tomb, and use it as a positive experience. You know, I shared a few weeks ago about the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the story of Sidney Rittenberg. So what happened to this man is that he was forced into solitary for seven years. They let him out when they found out that he really wasn't an American spy offered to let him go home, and then they arrested him again during the Cultural Revolution and put him back in for five more years. Twelve years in solitary, most of which time he couldn't speak, and not only that, no one could speak to him. They wouldn't allow him to hear a human voice. Now, this would drive most people crazy, and that was the idea. But what happened to this guy, who was raised in an atheist family as a communist, he didn't have any religious training, what happened to him was he had an enlightenment experience, and he came into an allness. He got in touch with, he said, I, I just started thinking about what was beyond thinking and about reality, beyond reality, and I suddenly got in touch with the fact that there was something greater, there was something more, and I got, he says, I was totally into it and totally out of it, and I had experiences that equal all of the mystical experiences and enlightenment experiences that I read about now, because he came back home after they let him out the second time, he was smart enough to do that. But today, he's in his 90s, and he travels back and forth to China, and he helps people, but he's also a spiritual teacher. Now, what I'm telling you this, because a guy who has no religious background at all went into the tomb, and he came out with an enlightenment experience. Whatever it is that you're dealing with in your life, whatever you're facing, know that there is a next spiritual step, but it means you've got to let go of what has been familiar. Your reality, as you understood it, no longer serves you. My reality no longer serves me. Together, my reality no longer serves me. And I choose a new reality. Together, and I choose a new reality. I'm going to tell the parable. I told it on Good Friday. The parable of the trip to Europe. And it came to me in meditation about two weeks ago. And uh, just see if this does something for you. Imagine you're on the west coast of the United States. And the, uh, you've heard about this place called Europe. And you, you want to go there because you know it's a wonderful thing and you know you're supposed to go there. So you get on a train and you travel by rail all the way across the United States and then you get off where the ocean is. The Atlantic Ocean stops you in New York City and you go, oh, I can't go any farther and I'm not in Europe. What stop? Well, I know that the answer is to ride the rails. I know that the rails is how I'm going to get there. So you go into the subway system of New York and you go around and around for several years. <laughs> that would be the end of the story. But then finally you realize, wait a minute, there's something. You hear about something called uh, JFK Airport. And you go there and you, get, and you try a different means of transportation. You try something new. The caterpillar has to become a butterfly. The old consciousness becomes the Christ consciousness. The human level becomes the spiritual level. You have to let go of the familiarity of what it is you thought your reality or even your good was. And you know what? When you were traveling cross country on that train, you were doing the right thing. Everything about it was good and right and true. But it had a limitation. And so what is your limitation? And what is your next spiritual step? Are you willing to take your next spiritual step? Are you willing to move into that joy, you know, that joy that will lead you to the, that will give you liftoff, that will lead you into that next spiritual step. I had a, a picture of, of, of a cup, and what I got was, your capacity for joy is up to you, but the joy is filled by God. And so how big is your cup? So God, expand the size of my cup. And then that joy gets poured into it, and it's greater and greater. God, expand the size of my cup. Together, 
God, expand the size of my cup. How can you expand the size of your cup? You've got to take a step. Next Sunday, Peggy Dot and I are going to be hosting something at 1020. It will happen uh, every Sunday at 1020 between services. It's called the Simple Reverent Prayer Circle. And we will pray together here. Uh, this last time that we did it, we did kind of a trial run and worked out the bugs. Now it's all ready to go. And probably 20, 25 people came. The idea is where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. It is reaching out in spiritual community to other people who have needs, who may be hurting, who we're praying for as individuals. But no longer are we going to just pray for them individually. We get to get the whole group consciousness together. And further, we don't bring our own problems into the circle. The chaplains will help you with your problems after the service you want somebody to pray with. But just as they are getting a benefit, by praying with you, even though they're not praying for themselves, they're not selfish, they want to give you the benefit. So they're saying here, between services, we'll have the simple reverent prayer service, and I open it and Peggy ends it, and we'll pray for people, we'll say their names going around the circle. Now you might think, what is the good of that? What the good of that is, is that you are laying up treasures in the kingdom of all possibility, the kingdom of heaven, which is that wonderful spiritual dimension if you give of yourself in this way, you are placing a deposit in the spiritual bank account that then will bear fruit later on in your life. So, so I want to invite you to come a little early. Come at 1020 next week, and every week thereafter it will be available. Come whenever you can. But it's to build this consciousness together. Each one of us has a consciousness, but it's unfamiliar to us. It's, it's new to us. We've got to do something to open ourselves up to it. We call that consciousness the Christ consciousness. We call it in the East, uh, the Buddha nature. In some places they call it the higher self. Or some people don't even have names for it. But it's the next step in spiritual awareness. Robert Johnson, who's a wonderful spiritual psychologist, a great spiritual master, he's passed on, but he wrote a number of books. And in one of them he said something, I don't know if it's true or not, but it sure works well in this talk, so I'm going to quote it. He said that just as um, the, the third dimensional consciousness, the human consciousness is being birthed into a new spiritual consciousness, we can see in human history how uh, humanity has changed in terms of how it hears sound and sees colors. He said that uh, there's no recorded uh, place in history until the last few hundred years of harmony. All the singing, all the music was um, in unison. And the capacity to discern and understand harmony is something that's relatively new in the human experience. We evolved as a race of humanity to the place where we could hear and engage harmony. He also said in terms of color, there's no place in the Hebrew scriptures or in the Greek writings or the Chinese writings from uh, over a thousand years ago that mentions the color blue. It's not mentioned at all that Homer talks about the wine dark sea. And he says that the capacity to recognize blue as blue is relatively recent. That we as a race of humanity have evolved to that place. My daughter questioned that when I told her about it and I said, look, I don't know if it's true or not, but it sure sounds good to me. <laughs> it, it opens us up to that possibility that there is something more. So, in your life, what is that something more for you? Could that something more be something that seems very mundane, but it gives you joy, and you follow it? There's a great physicist who won a Nobel Prize. His name was Richard Feynman. How many people know who Richard Feynman was? You may recognize him because he's the fellow who discovered what caused the space shuttle disaster and what caused it. He was the head of that committee, and he won a Nobel Prize for physics. But, but he wrote in one of his books something very interesting. He was burned out. He was depressed. His life seemed to have no meaning and purpose. He was part of the original group of scientists who created the atomic bomb in Los Alamos. And while that was happening, his wife was dying in Albuquerque of tuberculosis. And then he found out what his, all the work that he did led to, 
And although he understood the military reason for it, it wasn't the legacy he wanted to leave with his life, and he felt very sad about his life. He felt kind of empty, and he was on the faculty of Princeton, but the joy had gone out of his life. And he was sitting there in the cafeteria pondering, what is it that I've lost? What is it that brought me into science that made me happy? What was my, as Joseph Campbell calls it, my bliss? What interested me? And in that moment, he noticed one of the students in the cafeteria spinning a, a ceramic plate on his finger, and he looked at it and he asked himself, what is the ratio between the rotation of the plate and the wobbles? He noticed it wobbled. And he, and he thought, you know, I'm going to throw away all this other stuff I'm doing, because he had to print research papers. He said, I'm going to publish a paper on the wobble and the spin of spinning plates, because that's the kind of puzzle that got him into science. And he did this, and of course, all of his friends and all of his colleagues thought he was cracked. He caught a lot of flack for it, but he didn't care. He stayed with it. He continued to work on the wobble and the spin that led to one thing, led to another, and led to the Nobel Prize for Physics. Because that little thing led him on that journey. Now, where on your journey, where do you need to get lift off? Where do you need to say, okay, I've been doing this thing, whatever this thing is, and I'm going to do something different. I'm going to try something different. I may, I may do the simple river curve circle. I may begin a little bit of quietness. I may go into the quiet space that's symbolized by the tomb, but it's not a negative thing. It's, it's a quiet space. During meditation, we assumed, what do we feel like when we love? What do we feel like when we're in this higher consciousness? You can imagine that. That's called meditation. It's nothing mystical. It's something that's an innate part of you. You have the capacity for it. You could do this thing. You can do this thing. I can do this thing. Together, I can do this thing. And I'm cheering you on. I'm cheering you on because I know you're made of greater stuff. That you have the capacity to move into a greater consciousness. I want to share something else. You know, what, the question I have is, what are your spinning plates? The question I have is, what is that line of demarcation that will give you liftoff so that you can take your journey to where you need to go? In the case of a man in my last church, it was stealing uh, a six-pack of beer and being thrown into jail. And then when they find out that he was a homeless drug addict, the judicial system put him into recovery. And uh, his name, because he talks about this, is Kim. This, many of you have heard of him. I talked to him about him a couple weeks ago. Kim was a member of our church, but the way he got into it was very interesting. He was living homeless. He stole a six-pack of beer. He was arrested. And they put him into recovery. And it was required. And he thought his 11th step, he would go to a church. He ended up getting a ride because they didn't allow him to drive. He had his license taken away. He'd been raised with a lot of privilege, a lot of good things, but uh, he'd fallen on these hard times because of his addiction. Well, he started singing in the choir, and he, he'd always had a good voice, but he took the 4T Prosperity Program, which we're going to be having on Tuesday, and he thought to himself, you know, I, I, think, I think I want to do something more with this. Now, he was already singing at bar mitzvahs and weddings, and, and whenever he'd get a little money ahead, he'd put it aside, and he'd go into the studio, and he'd, he'd record a song, and... And he did this for several years. He took 4T three times while he was doing this. But what he, he was doing was, and it takes him five years on the average to do an album. Now he, uh, he, he went ahead and, and, and got the album together and shopped it around. Nobody was interested because it was, it was of another era. It was uh, too melodic. It was too old time you know, jazz. It sounded like, kind of like Al Jarreau. It's kind of soft jazz. So people were saying, no, nah, there's no market for this thing nowadays. It's your time has passed. But he stayed true to his vision. The, 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 the spinning plates, the, the idea of this is my bliss. He followed his bliss and he put it out himself. And somebody gave it to somebody at Motown. They put it out and he's had one number two worldwide. Number one, two number one on the R&B charts. One number two and uh, one number one in the, in the worldwide in terms of, uh, of albums. Second in the whole world in terms of sales. Now, I'm telling you this because it took something that seemed very difficult or very negative for him to make a decision that he's going to get lift off, that he's going to move into something new. In your life, you need to ask yourself, what am I willing 
to do that would be and represent for me moving in to a new way of looking at things. I remember somebody uh, shared an article with me many years ago about a travel writer. And this travel writer had uh, gone to northern Italy and gone to a monastery where a lot of uh, pilgrims would go because there was the Stations of the Cross and it was considered to be a very holy place. And so he, although he wasn't Catholic, went to all the Stations of the Cross and he got to the cross and it was wonderful and he thought that was nice. And he's ready to turn away and he noticed off to the right in the weeds, it almost looked like, almost looked like there was a path, but not really. But he thought, you know, maybe I'm going to try this. And he kind of pushed through the weeds and he got up there and there was the resurrection. Everybody had stopped at the cross. Nobody went to the next step. Now, how many of us think that our lives are about the suffering, the difficulty, the story, even the day-to-day -day mundane stuff? Are we willing to push on? Are we willing to move into this life-filled experience that Easter is, whether it's the Easter of the bunny, the wabbit, uh, whether it's the Easter of the, of the egg, whether it's the Easter of the resurrection and the Easter of your spinning plates, the Easter of your waking up and deciding to try something new? And so my challenge to you this morning is pick something in your life or let it pick you that gives you bliss, that moves you forward and dedicate yourself to it. Not as a burden, not as something difficult or hard or drudgery, but something that truly lifts up your heart. And then dedicate yourself to it with diligence and engagement. What I'm going to do right now is invite you to join with me in prayer. So let's just close our eyes. And just in a moment... If you know what it is, you've been thinking about it, you've been pondering it during the talk, if you know what you th think your next spiritual step is, that's a good thing. But if you don't, just be open to it dropping into your heart. And in this moment, know. Know that there is that in you that already knows. And simply ask the question, if I already knew what my next spiritual step is, what would it be? If I already knew what my next spiritual step was, what would it be? And then listen. And it's okay whether or not you had any impression at all because it's there. It will come and seek you. You've opened your heart. You've opened your mind. You've created a welcoming, opening space. And we give thanks. Thank you, God. And so it is. And now this is the time of dropping into your heart space. Just imagine yourself moving, moving into your heart space. Just move down into your heart. And rest there for a moment. And take a deep breath and let it out. And open your hands and let go of all your papers because you don't need them in this moment. And take another deep breath and let it out. And if you're puzzling over how you could take a spiritual step, just assume that you can. Just make the assumption, if I already was ready to take my spiritual step, how would I feel? And assume that feeling. If I already knew what to do, how calm would I be? If I had no anxiety, no fear or hesitation, how would the world look to me? If I knew how to love, really love, how would my heart feel in this moment? How would people look different to me? If my willingness to move ahead with my life courageously with my whole heart was strengthened how would my whole heart feel? What might I think? 
What feelings might I have? How would I show up in the world differently? If I were lifted into my Christ consciousness, my higher self, how would this affect my breathing, my posture, look on my face, <coughs> my thinking, my feeling, how I show up? And I just rest for a while asking these questions, assuming the response, if I were already what I want to be, how would that be? If I were love, <coughs> if I were in love and felt the flow of love, how would it soften me? This is my Easter step, regardless of whatever other steps <coughs> I might take. carry this with me. I am transformed. And I am grateful. And so it is. Well, we're going to uh, move into our time of giving, and, and our giving is in anticipation of the joy to come. So I give in anticipation of my joy to come, and I receive abundantly. Together, I give in anticipation of my joy to come, and I receive abundantly and silently. And together aloud. I give in anticipation of my joy to come. And I receive abundantly. And so it is.